Chief Environment Court Judge David Kirkpatrick will speak this morning on the resource management reform, the future landscape. Over to you. Tēnā koutou kua hui hui mai nei, e mihi ana ki nga mana whenua puta noa, ki a ranga nui tēnā koe, ki a papatua nuku tēnā koe, ki a mihi o ki te honga kua wehi mai nei i a tātau, ki a mihi o ke tēnā koutou e te honga ora, ki a hoa mei o hoa mahi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, Ko David Kirkpatrick tōku ingoa no Tamaki Makaurau ahau e mahi ana o hei kai whakawā ki te kotitao o Aotearoa no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I greet everyone meeting here. I greet tangata whenua. I greet the sky and the land. I greet those gone before us. I greet those who are here now, friends and colleagues. My name is David Kirkpatrick of Auckland. I'm the Chief Environment Court Judge. Greetings to you all. Uh, I have to start... What an interesting... Here we are. <laughs> I have to start... It worked, at least. I have to start with some disclaimers, and actually I realise now that the first disclaimer is that there are no pictures in my presentation. Um, sadly, I trained as a lawyer, and so words are my colours. And I hope there's a little bit of colour in my presentation. There's a constitutional disclaimer. Obviously, the resource management legislation is the subject of work being done by the Minister for the Environment and his ministry to be placed in front of the House of Representatives. It is not the place of judges to trespass on the work being done by ministers of the Crown or the work being done by the legislature. But I will offer some comments. Um, we have that separation of powers uh, to provide us with independence to ensure an open and fair assessment of issues uh, by means of a shared structure and approach. So I will offer some comments, but I, I clearly respect uh, the role which the executive and the legislature have in the process. It's not just the Minister for the Environment. I'm told that the law reform process involves 13 other ministers and 17 Crown agencies. I'm told that the drafting thus far has got them up to around 800 pages. I am worried at those numbers. Um, the judicial disclaimer, I speak for myself, but I speak often with my colleagues, um, and generally on the Environment Court we share a wide range of views. But uh, please do not cite my presentation back to me, or attempt to cite it to one of my colleagues. So. The scope of my presentation, um, it was going to be about the three proposed acts from a judicial point of view, but of course bills have not yet been introduced. I could finish here, you could have an early morning tea. Uh, the organisers would be angry with me, but you wouldn't be too concerned about that. Um, so instead I'm going to talk about a series of issues. I think I should start, of course, by congratulating the Institute on its anniversary. I think that that is a tremendous achievement, and I uh, wish you all the best for the next 50 years. Um, the topics then that follow from the three proposed acts are something of a grab bag, but they do touch on things which I have observed in my work uh, in the resource management field uh, as a legal practitioner and more recently as a judge. I'll talk about the framework for adjudicating disputes obviously from the point of view of one who listens to the disputes. I'll talk about social and cultural considerations and tikanga, and there's a very recent decision which uh, has arrived uh, since I prepared these notes, but I'll, I'll touch on that. I'll talk about consent processing options, which I suspect is probably going to be the main difference in terms of the new uh, legislation, the Natural and Built Environments Bill that comes forward and what we may think we know based on what's happening at the moment. And finally, I can't let the opportunity pass without talking about expert evidence about matters of assessment. So, 
If we start with the reform legislation, I'm sure most of you know this, there's just a few points to make in relation to this. Three bills are expected, um, referred to as if they are acts. Um, a lot may depend on the timing. It is difficult to be specific about these things. But it's important to see the three in, this, in the way the reforms have been talked about as elements of a single triangle. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite important to see them in terms of their relationships as opposed to in terms of their differences. So if we start with the Natural and Built Environments Act, people do note that calling it the NBAA runs a risk of having ESPN claim a copyright infringement. But B leaves out the word environment, and um, I'm not sure if, if that's just a shorthand thing or if it replaces a wider problem. The Minister has stated that his aims are to better protect and restore the natural environment, to provide clear national direction on biophysical limits through a national planning framework and regional spatial strategies, to resolve conflicts and to provide an adequate budget, which will be um, a great thing should that happen. All of that obviously is laudable, but the devil is in the detail, uh, including whether or not any close but different wording is used in the statute compared to what we've been using for the past 30 years. I mean, we survived a major transition in 1991. Uh, we did spend quite a lot of time referring to um, non-complying activities as specified departures. Um, those of you who were involved in giving evidence or participating under the Town and Country Planning Act will know that that was quite wrong. And whether or not we continue doing that with the new legislation, uh, I, I'd like to think that we can engage with it as it stands rather than attempt to interpret it in terms of old legislation. I am concerned from what I have heard and keep hearing that the minister and the ministry are trying to clear out references to qualitative factors in the assessment of proposals, either planned proposals or consent proposals. In particular, the phrase amenity values, possibly also the quality of the environment, possibly also what is appropriate or inappropriate, either in terms of a plan or in terms of a consent. Um, I'm told that amenity values is to be removed because it represents privilege. Um, indeed. <laughs> um, I think that the uh, people who first brought uh, town planning into the legislative field, and I'm thinking about um, reformers like Peel uh, in England in the Industrial Revolution, would be quite shocked to think that amenity values only relates to privilege. Um, and I'm, I'm a bit concerned that there's been a failure of definition, possibly a failure of definition in the legislation, possibly a failure by lawyers and judges who deal with words, possibly a failure by those who attempt to give evidence about what the facts of amenity values are. But that is something that we might all keep an eye on when it comes out. The second act is the Strategic or Spatial Planning Act. I'm not quite sure about the difference in the words. Um, I, I understand spatial planning to be a kind of strategic planning. I understand that the purpose of separating this out in a separate act is to give it more emphasis. And I was happy about that until I was asked the question, do we really need to do the spatial strategies before we develop the plans? <laughs> and that's a little bit like what I was asked when, we were taught, when I chaired the panel for the Auckland Unitary Plan, the independent hearings panel, and we were said, do we really need to do the RPS before we do the plan? And I said, yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean, generally speaking, you know, Alexander the Great or Eisenhower would have mapped out their strategy before they decided <laughs> to send people across the water or, or, or whatever. Generally speaking, you start at the top and identify your strategy and then say, okay, what's the best way of achieving that rather than at ground level? I've got to say, though, in the Auckland Unitary Plan, what we confronted was a mismatch of expectations from the institutions, generally advised by experts, about a top-down, strategically-based assessment, and from people, dare I call them real people, who basically said, what can I do with my property? What can I stop my neighbour doing 
if I don't like it, who have a very ground-based, bottom-up approach. And I'm, I'm worried that there's a mismatch in that conversation. Um, there's also the issue in terms of strategic or spatial planning about co-governance models, and I'll speak a little bit more about that when I touch on issues of tikanga. Um, I am worried that um, the co-governance debate is devolving into uh, slogans rather than any more careful, thoughtful debate about ways in which we might respond to the sorts of things that Elena was talking to us about earlier this morning. And then there's the Climate Change Adaptation Act, and I suppose my question is, should climate change adaptation be separate from the rest of the regime, or should it be integral to it? Should it be fundamental to it? And again, a lot of people know that building your house on sand is not a great idea. That's been spoken about for a long, long, long time. But, of course, the thing is, some of those sandy areas, river flats and so on, they're nice and flat. Why not build them there? And then when the river comes along and says, well, this is where I go, let's dam the river or put um, stop banks up. And, and we get into the whole thing. I, I suppose I'm just a little bit concerned that the policy in New Zealand, ever since we began legislating about climate change issues, has been that the participatory framework of our planning has not been applied for climate change. Maybe that's because our leaders are fearful of what might happen if there were a full participatory approach. On the other hand, I'm not sure that we've had terribly many specifics at a higher level about how we should be dealing with those things. There are hard issues under climate change. Managed retreat is only one of them. There are a whole lot of issues in relation to water that confront us. Uh, availability of water for our use, uh, control of water because of the effects that it can have on our lives, hazard management generally. Um, the, 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 we spend a lot of time talking about these things. The one thing that we do know is that the hard issues are not made easier by delay. Now, this is back to stage one level, and I know you all know this, um, but it bears repeating. And in many situations, and often when I find myself talking with um, policy people, it needs to be repeated. So I'm going to begin at the beginning. It is important that our planning framework be based on sound principles. Again, there should be a strategic approach rather than the rules. I could speak for a long, long time about law being more based on principles than it is on rules. Because I'm afraid that a lot of people would like to jump to the rules first and then try to work backwards. And in my experience, that never works. Um, we need to think about the who, why, where, when, how, and what. We need to identify those things at the outset, again, before we jump to an answer. We need to start with issues in the broader sense. We need to think about our options. We need to consult, which means talking to people before we've decided what it is we're going to do, and ask them what they think we ought to do. Analyze what we think, analyze what the people we've consulted think, and then come up with a proposal. Monitor, review, repeat, rinse if necessary. But the main thing is don't jump to conclusions. And I suppose in terms of amenity values and so on, do not privilege outcomes. Do not say that things must always be done in the way in which they've always been done. Think about the thing that changing circumstances, the, the idea that changing circumstances requires a change in approach. And I think that, you know, to be fair, if the minister or, or one of his senior advisors were here saying, well, just hang on here, I'd say fair enough, there are plenty of examples where the planning process has jumped to conclusions and we found out later that those weren't necessarily the best ways of doing things. But the answer to that is not to, to deny people the opportunity to investigate certain issues, such as amenity values, but to say, OK, let's have a bit more rigour around that. I mean, I think that's one of the things where Te Tangi Ate Manu uh, is excellent work, because it, would, it should assist us Rather than just saying amenity values, we say this is what we're talking about in this situation for this community or these communities. And I think that that's extremely important. 
Similarly, there's the public policy cycle. Um, and again, I've presented this slide on numerous occasions. I'm going to keep presenting it. The principles that are set out here about the way in which we should develop policy are actually fundamental to democracy because they involve a participatory framework. New Zealand, I think, goes, there's a pendulum between centralization and, and decentralization or devolution. I think we're in a centralization phase on the pendulum at the moment. I'm a little bit worried that as a small country that can turn on a, on a sixpence, um, or, or whatever, I'm not sure what the smallest coin we have these days is any longer, um, that we think, oh well, we can do it really quickly. We've got a, a one-stop shop um, legislature which can change the law overnight, unlike a lot of other countries, say the United States, where they can't do anything. Um, and we think that that means that we can just keep changing things. And I'm very concerned that that does mean that we jump from one thing to the other. And I think if we adhered more closely to the policy cycle, we might get some more robust um, outcomes. Talk a little bit about the role of the Environment Court, um, and really it's about the role of the Environment Court in a time of change. And the history of the Environment Court goes, goes a long, long way back. Um, if you go right back, it probably goes back to the roads boards, that even as boroughs um, at the outset of our local government framework were being incorporated. We had roads boards to run the roads. And um, as everybody who studied town planning knows, communication is ultimately the, the source of most of our development. Um, and the roads boards turned into town and country planning boards, town and country planning appeal board, the planning tribunal onto the environment court. There's a degree, and possibly I'm oversensitive, but there's a degree to which my other judicial colleagues, in what they like to call the real courts, feel that town planning is still essentially an administrative task, and that uh, the main debates that go on, um, sometimes people killing one another, sometimes people collecting money from one another, sometimes those two things overlap, um, that, that that's quite a different thing to uh, working out how high a building ought to be or where a road ought to run. I, I think that when people have disputes, they need a decent, clear, independent dispute resolution service to avoid murder. Um, <laughs> and and the, the real difference is that the Environment Court tends to say, what should we be doing? how should we approach the future as opposed to the murder case, which is who did it, or the, or the debt collecting case, which is who owes the money to who. And I think that that is just as uh, the, the need for independent decision making, that is to say judicial decision making, is just as important in terms of that role. Um, so, and I mean, I, I, I maybe, as I say, I'm oversensitive and I'm worrying too much. Um, Tony Randerson was very clear in his report and, and his group were very clear that the Environment Court had a role to play. The minister has been very clear in his speeches that the Environment Court still has a role to play. But I'll come back to this in a little while about one of the reasons why I, I still remain fearful. Um, the role of a judicial decision maker, the third limb of the uh, of the framework for government, constitutional legitimacy, uh, which is that the legislature should not interpret its own laws, the executive should not judge its own actions, you should have an independent judiciary who interpret the law and to apply that law to the actions of the executive. We are meant to provide case specific rulings in ration, or through rational and fair processes. We swear an oath to do justice to all manner of people without fear or favour affection or ill will. And we are meant to keep ourselves independent uh, from the debates that are going on, um, notwithstanding that I'm here now, uh, in order to be able to present uh, what is clearly and accepted by the parties as a fair process. We're meant to do it rationally, that is to say without logical or cognitive fallacies. We're meant to hear interested parties 
And we're meant to try to provide for equality of arms. We're meant to have a level playing field on which both sides, or all of the sides, development, entity, port, transport agency, can meet equally with local people, homeowners, tangata whenua, people who advocate for the environment, the uh, flora and fauna who cannot advocate for themselves, so that everybody gets a fair crack in terms of what the issues are. Um, in relation to tikanga, the Environment Court has a particular statutory obligation to recognise tikanga where appropriate, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Substantive recognition is increasingly an issue before us, and um, what that means is important. As I say, the Supreme Court has issued an important decision uh, uh, earlier, a few days ago, in relation to this, that will require some quite close study. And so I think I'm starting to repeat myself here. I'll, um, I'll cut to one of the main things about this, which is the issue about the process, and that is efficiency based on objectives. Um, and I talk about this a little bit more in due course. But the thing I'd like to put in your minds at the moment, a lot of people talk about efficiency, and when they talk about efficiency, it's getting the most widgets at the least cost. But not everything in our lives is a case of producing widgets or spending money. I, um, I was a bit concerned. I, I was adjudicating a mock trial yesterday at the law school, and I was asking the uh, students about what they meant by efficiency, and they said, most production at least cost, greatest throughput uh, at the least cost. I said, well, what about the costs to the environment? What about the costs to people that aren't quantifiable? And they looked blankly at me for a while. Um, it is one of the issues, and it, co it comes back to the whole point of trying to put a framework around our qualitative assessments, a framework around the values that are not readily reducible to dollars, but nonetheless, which we regard as being valuable to us. And that is something that has to happen, I think, in a judicial process. We come now to tikanga. Um, the first bullet point is an amalgam of various statutory definitions. The, the resource management definition of tikanga is Māori customary values and practices. I've got to say that I think, in terms of my study of language uh, over many years, it is simply inappropriate to define te reo in English. You can interpret te reo, you can translate it. Interpret is take a meaning that's in between. Translate is to take it from one place and move it to another place. And that's fine, but to define tikanga in English in a statute uh, and I think this is something that Elena was talking about as well. I, I just don't think that that's right. We need to understand tikanga in the way in which tikanga has developed, which means we have to understand it in the sense in which the people who use that word mean it. Now, my attempt at that, and this is dangerous, obviously, given what I've just said, um, as Elena said, tikanga comes from the, the root tika, Na at the end is a, a way of turning it into a, a broader vowel. And the words that are given in uh, various Māori dictionaries are correct, true, right, fair, just, appropriate, lawful, proper, valid. And I think you'd agree that all of those words hang together reasonably well. Apparently the etymology is from um, a word in a, in a proto-Pacific language or, or the Proto-Pacific language, meaning dart or arrow. And I think there's an interesting point there, because I think that in Europe, the dart or the arrow is a metaphor for straight and true. And so obviously it's also a metaphor in the Pacific for straight and true. But more generally, and in terms of today's language, the English words that I've set out there I think are words that we would all understand were part of what we mean when we say justice. I think that they are concepts that can sit very happily side by side. I don't mean to appropriate or assimilate tikanga. 
But what I do say is that in thinking about the differences, we can actually also see commonality. And I think that's true in many things. That rather than saying it's off or on, it's black or white, it's this or that, we can say it's both off and on. It's both black and white. It's both this and that. And I think that we can um, pull those things together for that. I think I'm being told to move m more quickly. Um, so I will. I've seen this distinction raised about why tikanga and the common law are different, but I'm not sure that the binary view is ever truly helpful. I'm not sure that it's accurate. I think that collective well-being and national commonality are actually closely related. I think that local differences in individual rights are also related. I think that um, in order to get to legal positivism, that is to say, this is the law, you need to work out what the values are. All of law is based on values. You shall not murder in the Ten Commandments, that's a value. It needed to be said because otherwise people would just go around murdering one another. So we say, no, we don't want murder and we don't want people driving over 50 kilometers an hour or whatever speed it may be in a neighborhood because it's unsafe. Those are values that we choose. And so this idea that, oh, certain things are robust and factual and can be stated clearly and other things are vague and ineffable, like amenity values, I don't accept that. I just think we may need to do a little bit more work around identifying what the concrete or factual aspects of our values are. And so I say that, generally speaking, if somebody is advancing an argument based on a binary analysis, it's probably founded on a cognitive error. I think the context, uh, and this, the, throughout the law, throughout the case law, is the statement that context is everything. So when uh, Gavin uh, is talking to you about the importance of context and taking your values from context, that's a legal principle. It's an important principle. The other thing is some people say, well, I have my rights. Everyone has rights. And there are no rights without corresponding obligations. And when somebody says, I own this, what they're really saying is, I have a right to possess this that is greater than your right. But merely because I own this car and have a right to possess it and sit in it and drive it, doesn't mean that I should lose sight of the obligations I have to drive it safely to make sure that its, if its exhaust isn't creating uh, terrible discharges, and so on and so forth. So these things need to fit together more in terms of a social dynamic of rights and obligations and not unilateral positions. Uh, politics doesn't work that way, I understand that, but it would be nice to think that both legislation and judicial decisions would do that. <laughs> Um, I've already said Section 269 of the Act requires the Environment Court to recognise tikanga where appropriate. The question is, where would it not be appropriate? I mean, there may be cases where you say the context is not tikanga driven, but nonetheless, where would it not be appropriate? I've got the red flashing light coming up now, <laughs> so I, I do have to move on. The other thing, of course, is appropriate, and as I've said earlier, appropriate is a word of vast meaning, a bit like minor. Um, and I think that we need to, and again, I could spend an hour on minor. But... <laughs> Uh, I want to pick up on another reference to uh, Justice Joseph Williams. Available online is his Harkness uh, lecture, Lex Aotearoa, and Heroic Attempt to Map the Māori Dimension in Modern New Zealand Law. It's, it, and it's, um, as I say, nearly 10 years old. It's an important uh, discussion of these issues. It's well worth reading. Um, Justice Glazebrook's uh, decision and Justice Williams' decision in the Ellis decision about tikanga, worth reading. Probably a little bit shorter than Lex Aotearoa, but um, very important to read. So as I say, my suggestion is there's a pattern for both tikanga and the common law in this process. I have to rip through this now because I've taken so long. 
What we have seen in recent years is a plethora of uh, consent processing uh, processes. And I suppose the worry that I've got is that what we seem to have happening is instead of saying every case should go through a proper judicial process, we're getting bespoke processes, and everybody likes bespoke because you like to hold bespoke and so on. Um, <laughs> but justice doesn't always work by saying, oh, well, for your case, we're going to do it this way. Because people will say, well, I was expecting it to be done this way. And, you know, I don't get to cross-examine witnesses in the fast-track consenting process. Direct referrals, I don't get a chance to test things in front of the council. Um, Call-ins by the minister, on what basis is the minister calling that in? Why is it being done that way? Uh, I think, and, and it, most of this is heading back to decision-making by executive decision rather than decision making through a judicial process. And I have to go quickly. I do want to say this, again I come back to efficiency as I said I would. Minister will say, oh but these are more efficient ways of doing it. What they mean is it's quicker. Sometimes cases are not best resolved quickly. Sometimes cases take a while to sort out. What is the efficiency in terms of justice? What is the efficiency in terms of a ro robust outcome that parties say, yeah, we'll live with that? Don't necessarily agree, but we'll live with it. What is uh, sustainable in the longer term? It's not just making decisions like that. And finally about evidence, and the good news is I can't rant at you too much about evidence because I've run out of time. Um, I do want to stress a few things that are still going to be important. I'd just like to say who is an expert and ask you to reflect on that role when you're giving evidence. A person with specialised knowledge or skill based on training, study or experience. So there needs to be that background. A person who complies with the code of conduct, which we're just reviewing, which is emphasising cooperation, emphasising trying to work together to address the difficult issues that we're dealing with. A person whose evidence complies with Section 25 of the Evidence Act, and that rather opaque statement means what you um, say in your evidence has to give substantial help to the decision maker in working out what's going on. So it's not a set of theories, it's not a freestyle exercise, it's something which actually focuses on what's going on and provides some, some help to the decision maker. And that's something where the court believes that this will assist. Now, it says on here guidelines and the court respects that. I know that not everyone agrees with everything that's in this. Good. Don't expect you to. We expect you to be independent. We expect you to form your own opinions. But there needs to be a structure for it. And if you're not going to use the structure here or all of it, you'll need to be very clear about the basis for which you are doing it. Perfectly fine if you've got your own basis for doing it, but you need to state it. You can't just turn up and say, it is because I say so. That's not evidence. That's freestyle. Frank Lloyd Wright once said, an expert is a person who has stopped thinking because they know. <laughs> Don't be that kind of expert. Again, I repeat what, what Gavin was saying, there is no formula, there is judgment. And if you are experienced, if you are skilled, if you have developed knowledge, then you can bring judgment to bear, and that is what the court is looking for. Um, and then some stuff that uh, I've repeated over and over again, and the time has gone off, which I don't think is a good sign at all. <laughs> Our practice note, sorry, I need to go back. Our practice note is, oh, I've done it now. Our practice note is being reviewed. It should be published very shortly. It adds some matters to the code of conduct for expert witnesses, mainly around cooperation and mainly around identifying knowledge gaps either knowledge gaps generally in the state of the art or knowledge gaps in a particular case. Um, so I would ask you when that comes out, have a look at that if you're going to be giving evidence in front of the Environment Court. I have valued um, taking your time, I've taken too much of your time.
But thank you very much. Uh, best wishes for the conference, best wishes to the Institute for its next 50 years. Tamakotu kato. I never want to upset Malin. <laughs> I've always wanted to wag my finger at a judge. <laughs> <laughs> what an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Really appreciated your response to the um, various messages you were getting. It was easier done there than me twitching. <laughs>